Hi, this is David from You Can't Laugh at That, the podcast where we take topics that, yeah, you know, the deal. Listen, this is our 50th episode, and we just want to thank you from the bottom of our collective hearts for listening to this experiment and trying to find the funny in things that, well, when you're in the moment, aren't funny. Being able to laugh at something gives you power over that thing, whether you know it or not. And that is why it's so rewarding as a comedian to get on stage and to share laughter with a group of people that you've never met. And that's what we want to do with this podcast is we want to share all the reasons why each one of these topics is funny. And we're at the 50th topic. In addition to, I don't even know how many other bonus episodes we've done. We've done at least 10. But the whole goal here is to prove that life is a little less serious than we make it. And I'm so grateful to everybody who's been a part of this podcast. I want to thank Jeremy Demery at Golden Ox Studios, my co-host Steve Mers, who has been a stalwart in the Cleveland comedy scene and one of the funniest, punchiest joke writers that I have ever met for swooping in each part of every episode with his one-liners, his non-sequiturs, and his unique perspective on comedy. I want to thank every single guest that we've had. I want to thank you, all of our listeners. If you've ever listened to an episode of this podcast, will you please do us a favor? Get on Apple Podcasts and throw us a five-star rating because the more of those that we get, the more the algorithm reaches more people. And when we do that, we're able to share with more people all the things that we've found funny because there are so many people out there that are dealing with some of these topics that we've dealt with and can't find the levity, can't get any perspective on it. All we want to do is offer a different point of view on it in a way that brings joy. So thank you for listening. Thank you for contributing. Thank you for sharing, liking, commenting. We want to start a conversation about each one of these topics. If, you ha- if this is the first episode of our podcast that you've listened to, there's a lot to go back and go through. So, so find the topics that resonate with you and tell us how you did laugh at that. Tell us how you couldn't laugh at that and how you found the funny in it. Because there is always another way to look at it. Always a way to prove that you can laugh at that. You can treat your life like, oh, this is the episode of the sitcom about my life where I go through this. Mm -hmm. This is the episode (laughs) of the TV show about me where I have to handle this, where I go through this. And it can alleviate some of the the stress and pressure of the moment. Anytime that you bring up a topic where, you know, we know that we're in the danger zone, there's so much work that has to happen in the setup to get the audience to not just uh, immediately, you know? Yeah. I've got a joke about abortion. I've got this joke, of course. I got a joke about pedophilia. That's more specifically about pedophilia than this joke. Mm-hmm. And the the care of going into the joke, kind of unconsciously communicating to the audience, I promise you, I am not going to say the thing you don't want me to say about this. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, I promise you that's not what this joke is. And it's it's subtle and it's hard, but it's necessary if you're a comic like me and not like mm-hmm. an Anthony Jeselnik type, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. At no point in the joke do I make it seem like Megan's Law is a bad law. Right. <laughs> that is the thing we should give do away with. <laughs> yeah, you're not like, listen, this is bullshit. <laughs> you can't laugh at that. Hey, this is David from You Can't Laugh at That. Hey, if you enjoyed listening to this podcast, and if you found value in any of the episodes, or if you've laughed even once, consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash you can't laugh pod. Now, these conversations we have with all these awesome comedians typically last about two hours, so there's so much footage we have to cut from every single episode, and we hate that we have to cut it, and we don't want it to disappear into the ether, which is why we edit it together into exclusive clips. Some episodes, they're 15 minutes, a half hour of extra footage. Other episodes, it's a little bit shorter. 
Either way, if you enjoy listening to You Can't Laugh at That, join our Patreon for exclusive access. And thanks for listening to our podcast and supporting comedy, because no matter how weird times get, remember that you can laugh at that. Today's guest is Jarrett Berenstein, a New York City comedian who has been on Fox's Laughs. He was a featured performer at the Bridgetown Comedy Festival, the North Carolina Comedy Arts Festival, and the Young Guns of Comedy Competition. He was a frequent performer at the UCB Theater when that was a thing, the Pit when that was a thing, and the Creek in the Cave also when that was a thing. Comedy's weird and different now. He's been the Time Out New York Critics Pick, CBS Local News Best of New York, the L.A. Comedy Festival's Best Solo Show, and the United Solo Theater Festival's Best Storytelling Show. We're happy to have him on the podcast. And just as a quick disclaimer, we do dive into some topics that may be considered traumatic for some listeners. We dive into the Sex Offenders Registry and... The point of this episode of the podcast is to highlight the absurdities of the policy itself when it unfortunately, unfairly targets people who have more innocuous offenses but are still labeled as sex offenders. Here we are with episode 50 of You Can't Laugh at That featuring Jared Berenstein, Steve Mers, and me. David Horning. Welcome to You Can't Laugh at That, the podcast where we take topics you can't laugh at and we find ways to laugh at them in the never-ending quest to prove that anything can be funny. Steve's here. He's playing with filters and that's fine. Steve, what's new with you today? Filters. That's it? Yeah. All right. Filters. Living a crazy life. Cancel your plans. You got to cycle through all the filters. Is that Tokyo or, or Jaipur? Jai poor. What? I don't know. Wasn't that an Instagram filter? Doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> joining us today from New York City, it's Jared Berenstein. What's Hello. up, man? What's going on, guys? Oh, you know, just working through technical difficulties. It's 2020. We're just, you know, living the American dream. I've been there. Cancel yes. your plans. Another victim of cancel culture. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I thought about that. <laughs> That's Didn't very true, that man. Slide. You can't. It's that's why this podcast exists. We're we're fighting the cancellation. We're fighting the man. <laughs> and what they did to pro- to Supreme President Trump is uncalled for. And if they can do it to him, they can do it to anybody, including you, Gina Carano. Our uh, <laughs> oh, Grande President Trump. <laughs> our guest. Uh, he has a book out about Kellyanne Conway. Uh, you want to dive a little bit into to what that's about? It's called the Kellyanne Conway Technique. Yeah. Well, this was a uh, this was a, a book that I got hired to write, which is it was hilarious to me because I actually tried to get a book published earlier in my life, like when I was I think maybe like ten years earlier or something, and it was so hard. It was so difficult. And then I just got this phone call one day that was like, hey, do you want to write a book making fun of Kellyanne Conway? And I was like, hell yeah, of course, that sounds great. That's a lot easier than the process I did last time. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so uh, they they were like this uh, publishing company. They, they saw this incredible, weird, caustic, volatile political environment that we were entering into in 2017. And they were like, let's get some books that might fly off the shelf. So they hired me to write this. I had a great time doing it, except for having to watch her interviews because they were just infuriating. But <laughs> it was it was really fun. Uh, worked really hard on it. They they sent me a contract. They were like, "Do you want f- uh, a certain amount of money just to write the book, or do you want residuals and less money right up front?" And I was like, "Well, I'll take the residuals. I'm going to bet on myself." Uh, and then the book sold <laughs> very poorly. So. Oh man. Uh, but it's been really fun to have. Like, it's been a great thing to, um, you know, I'm just, it, it's just an accomplishment to just like do it. And being able to sell it on the road has been really fun. And the friends of mine that have read it are like, yeah, this is really funny. So, yeah, I just kind of like pick things that she said in interviews, talk about why they're bullshit, make fun of them, you know, and uh, basically create like a fake structure of how you can also be a big liar. 
if you want and use the same techniques to get out of issues in your life. Is this book marketed to PR? Basically, yeah. yeah. You know, it's it's for spin. It's like a spin manual. Today we're not talking about Kellyanne Conway. Uh, we, we we can do a totally separate episode for that if you want. Uh, but uh, today we are going to be talking about what, Jarrett? Uh, the list, the, sec, the list of sex offender list. Yes, Megan's law. Yes, Megan and her law. Uh, if you're not familiar with Megan's law, it's hilarious. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's 100 not. Um, Long story short, seven-year-old girl uh, named Maureen uh, oh God, got, was this raised is in so Vermont. dark. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, her name was actually Megan, believe it or not, and uh, she was uh, sexually assaulted and murdered by a neighbor oh who God, was a this. sex offender. So we need a backstory. This is the origin story. This Back is the story. This is the prologue. And I did not feel bad opening. about this joke at all until you started saying this. David, proceed. You make it okay. Maybe we'll edit this and put this after you do. After we talk about the joke. No, it's uh, fine. I like all this. this is it's great. the power of editing. Very uncomfortable. But yeah, this is the prologue, and then we get to the opening credits, and then we get into the meat of the story. Mm. You know, we, we meet our protagonist, Jarrett, as he takes the stage at a, on a quest to prove that this incident. Uh, anyway, it's not. It's not David. <laughs> So, uh, so the guy that, that did it was a registered, uh, well, not at that time because that was a thing. Democrat. Yeah. <laughs> He's a liberal. He owned a pizza shop. Classic Antifa BLM. This yeah. guy. <laughs> he, uh, he was a sex offender. He had two previous counts of sex crimes. So, uh, Megan's parents went on a crusade and then, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene cornered them on a sidewalk and said, I have every right to be a sex offender and not tell anyone about it. That's my right as an American. You never that- even had a daughter named Megan. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Crisis actors. Right. Yeah. If you had a sec- an armed security guard outside of your house, you would have never had this problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, <laughs> because the only way to stop a sex offender, a bad sex offender with a gun is, <laughs> is a, with good a good sex, sex offender. offender. With, with right. Gun. Right. Um, so they went out and uh, demanded change of the law. And now if you are a registered uh, sex offender, you have to notify the local police and the community in which you live so that they know uh, that you're a sex offender. And the cool thing about that today is we can look it up on our phone. It's like a who's who of, of sex offenders. It's like Tinder for sex offenders. It's like uh, mm-hmm. Pokemon Go. You can just walk down the street and see where they are on a map. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, that's not what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Jarrett. Uh, Jarrett has a bit that uh, kind of touches on this topic and uh, is very funny. So if you want to introduce the the clip itself, and then we'll play it and talk about it. Sure. Uh, this is, um, uh, I was on tour with Steve Hofsetter uh, in California. I want to say maybe this was Monterey. I can't remember exactly. Um, mm. But yeah, uh, I think, uh, you know, Joke speaks for itself, so let's uh, let's get into it. I just learned about this law that says that if you are a registered sex offender, you need to introduce yourself to your neighbors and let them know that you are a registered sex offender. And it is not important how I learned about this law. <laughs> That's a good law, right? Like you want to know. You want to know if you're living next to a registered sex offender. But here's what's weird about that law: is that there's a lot of different ways to be a registered sex offender. For example, if you're an adult having sex with another adult in public and you get caught, you could be a sex offender that way. And you would need to tell your neighbors that. So there's dudes out there knocking on doors, being like, hello, I just moved in across the street. And by law, I have to tell you that I got my dick sucked at the zoo, what's up? I had to tell you that. By law, I had to tell you that I got my dick sucked at the zoo. I don't want to be doing this, but it's the law. It's the law. It's a great joke. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Uh, where'd it come from? How, how'd you come up with it? Uh, I used to uh, do a got show. dick sucked at the zoo. <laughs> Pretty regular. It's about me. <laughs> and I remember one of the employees very helpfully saying, you, you get caught doing this, you could be a registered sex offender. Yeah, put that snake down. I'm only allowed to do that if you're a monkey. Uh, I was for two years doing a show in New York called Current Events, which was not a unique name about a, for a show about the news, but I wanted to do a show where I took like an entire month's worth of news and wrote 
just like a whole bunch of jokes about it, kind of like synopsizing everything. And it went from politics to like weird crimes and stuff. There was always like a section where I was talking about what people in Florida were up to shooting, you know, grenade launchers into cop cars. (laughs) And uh, there was a a woman named uh, Crystal Metheny who uh, who got caught uh, trying to buy drugs, and I think she was buying Xanax or something. So that was fun. <laughs> uh, a buying a downer. She's definitely an upper. Yeah, I know. So there was a story about this couple that had sex. I forget what's called the public transportation system in Boston. Do you guys know what, what I'm talking about? It's like the big the dig or whatever. <laughs> it was it's called the big dig, but they the finished metro it. Metro or something. Yeah. I don't know. So the subway station, these two people got got caught for having sex on the subway station, but they were, have not been identified yet. They ran away before they could be held accountable. And the article said that if caught, they could be put on the regis- the sex offender registry because having sex in public, you know, could, kids could see, you know, uh, I don't know the rationale for that. But I just remember reading that and thinking, wait, so that guy's going to have to tell people that he's a sex offender. And he's going to have to tell people why he became a sex offender. And I was like, oh, so he'll be like psyched about that. Yeah. You know? And so that was the entire etymology of the joke. And then kind of working backwards from the punchline, um, I mean, you, you, you make it kind of bro because it's like, what kind of guy would, would brag about that to mm-hmm. strangers? <laughs> I'm imagining it's the same kind of guy who, you know, is so horny all the time that he needs to get his dick sucked at the zoo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, there's... <laughs> It's just a like certain kind of guy, I feel like, who no matter where he is, he's like, there's a pile of garbage here. I think I could fuck. I think <laughs> <laughs> I might be able to swing this, you know? Mm. Yeah. So, was, so, yeah, I figured that was that guy, you know? Yeah. In the flora and the fauna of this neighborhood. Let's go. Mm-hmm. And so, Sorry, wait, so I said the F word before I found out if I was okay to say the F word. Oh, you're good. Yeah. Oh, it all right. Matter. You know the uh, uh, so that's two that's two people that became sex offenders there at the zoo, right? Uh, the guy and the girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in the hypothetical, of yeah, my yeah. Joke, <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's she's standing next to him, embarrassed. Yeah, right. you know, or maybe she got away. Maybe she ran away. That yeah, could, the that one could that got happen. away. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you you find a lady that'll. <laughs> you got his dick sucked by a carp. The one that got away. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> At the zoo. Maybe it was yeah. a zoo employee and there was a massive cover-up. <laughs> right. right. You can't be too careful these days. Mm-hmm. Everything's right. a cover-up. So why the zoo? Did you did you try like other places? Uh, I did. I did. The first, uh, I had just gone on a date with uh, a girl to see the movie Zootopia. <laughs> and there okay. were a lot of kids there. <laughs> so I thought that that would fit in really well in the, in the universe yeah. of this, you know, where it's like, Obviously, this guy's a sex offender, but he wasn't having sex with the kids. He was just doing it in a place where there's lots of kids, which is obviously (laughs) awful also, you know. (laughs) Um, But I didn't like how placed in time that was, you know, to say the, the, you know, Zootopia. Mm -hmm. And I was also like, well, Zoo is also just kind of funny, you know, because it's not a particularly sexy place. And you don't go there at night, and there's not drinks usually. Yeah. So <laughs> it's a little bit more out there. It's very public. There is a possibility that the kids are there also, which I'm not. I'm just trying not to make it seem like that was something I needed for the joke. I'm just saying <laughs> it kind of lines up a little bit better with the Megan's Law, you know, theme of the of the bit. Right. And these are all things that people are picturing, at, as you say. I mean, you could just say sex at the zoo, like <laughs> you know, you don't have to explain all of those things. That those are things that people are naturally associating with the zoo anyway. So 100. <laughs> percent And that's the that's the the you just hit the nail on the head as far as what you want with a detail in your joke. You want it to explain a hundred things to your audience that you don't want to go into. Mm-hmm. You just want it to be that kind of evocative brain explosion where they fill in all the pieces that make it hilarious. Now, did you try to to uh, do the Zootopia thing when you first started telling the joke? Or? Oh yeah, and it worked. Yeah. It worked pretty well. But I just like the zoo better, and okay. I you know. I didn't do it enough times both ways to compare it to like put it on a chart to see which one was better. Mm-hmm. But I was just like, yeah, it's just better. So I just kept yeah. on doing it. It's simple. It works. Yeah. Yeah. It, it definitely evokes that, that, that mental, that mental picture. Yeah. Um, and then the idea that, that he asked to like Megan's law, you have to tell people that. And there are people who have been convicted of, uh, of sex crimes that were just totally harmless. 
to, to anyone else, you know, somebody mm-hmm. uh, peeing in an alley, although most states like that's more of an urban myth at this point um, where like they don't, most cops aren't going to knock you with a sex crime for peeing in an alley. If you're drunk, maybe a yeah. public intox or something, but you know, you don't want to, <laughs> they don't want people to have it, you know, that, that's going to ruin your life being in an alley. Like you have to be well, that to- was a plot point in uh horrible bosses. I think Charlie day's character got drunk and peed in a, in a in a in a playground or something at uh-huh. night, if I'm remembering correctly, <laughs> mm-hmm. and I remember that very specifically because I did that once when I was when I first moved to New York, and I got off a train because I had to pee so bad, and I was in the middle of nowhere, and there was just like this fenced off park in the middle of the night. I hopped the fence, I pissed, I felt so great that I decided to like jump off of one of the swings, <laughs> in just like you know jubilation at having been relieved and then a cop car saw me like you know did their boop boops and you know had asked me like to climb over the fence and to ask me what i was doing and i forget i think i'm pretty sure i lied i'm pretty sure i was like oh i just saw the empty thing and i was waiting for the train so i decided to play on the playground for a little bit get in some exercise yeah right yeah, exactly <laughs> my extra steps in for the day i'm swinging <laughs> it's, right, a crime, it's a crime sure. to swing I can't swing in America anymore <laughs> come on officer join me push me I want to get high <laughs> you know there's another swing right here yeah right yeah. <laughs> this could be the beginning of a lifelong friendship officer <laughs> I mean that's one of those things where it's like if you get to, if you have to pee and you're not hurting anybody and you're not doing it in like a blatantly obvious place, then like what's the harm? I did get dinged also once for trying to pee in, in between two parked cars. I think the cop thought I was trying to steal a car. Uh, but I remember just like kind of like sneaking around and kind of like getting <laughs> down. And then I saw the cop goes by and just like it's crazy and pulls back up and it's like, hey man, what are you doing? And I was like, uh, nothing. And he's like, come on, man, what are you doing? And I was like, trying to phrase it in a way where I couldn't get a ticket or anything so i was like i was thinking about maybe relieving myself in between these two cars because i really gotta go and he's like oh, okay well just don't do that and i was like cool yeah just don't do that <laughs> are you trying to steal a car i see your dicks out i've got a <laughs> i'm part of the <laughs> oh, can i tell this story real quick i got yeah. flashed okay. uh a couple of years ago um i was uh i was walking back from a gig in new york and there was a guy doing what I was trying to do. He was like in between two cars and he had his dick out and he was facing the sidewalk where I was walking. Mm-hmm. And so I saw this guy, I looked over, I saw his dick. I was like, that guy's trying to pee. I've been there. So then I get in my car and I drive past the exact same guy. And now he's facing the street with his dick out. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, no, this guy wasn't peeing. He's just out there with his dick. And whichever side somebody is coming on, he will turn to that side so that that you will see his genitals. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) That's hilarious. Listen, I'm cleaning up this block. You know, these kids don't know anything about the male anatomy. I'm just helping. I feel psychotic right now because I'm realizing I have so many stories about this. When I first moved to New York, I accidentally showed my dick to somebody once. Oh, <laughs> oh, do tell. Uh. I was on a subway platform. It was late at night. I had to pee. And I went all the way to the end of the platform where nobody was. I got behind one of those, you know, pillars and I took my myself out and I poked my head out to see if there was anybody there. And there was a guy there who was like, not so close, but was like in the danger zone. Like maybe he'll come a little bit further, you know? And I was kind of like looking at this guy and I realized, he's looking at me also. I realized that I didn't just poke my head out from behind the pillar. I actually stepped out from behind the pillar. So I had my dig in my hand. I was looking at this guy just being like, what do you think, buddy? (laughs) (laughs) So I'm new here. Where are the bathrooms? I just moved to this city. And I need to know what kind of dick I have. If it's good, <laughs> if it's bad. What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Where, I was so embarrassed that I was just like, all right, just zip myself back up. And I was like, I'll wait till I get home. Yeah, where are you from originally? I grew up in Los Angeles. I went to school in Ohio and then I moved to New York right after this. Uh, so yeah, so if you're coming from Ohio, like there's mm-hmm. there's a difference between physical appearance uh, compared, you know, the Midwest to New York. So you're a Midwest, are, am I a Midwest 10? <laughs> Or, or am I in New York six? Like I'm trying to figure out the scale. Yeah. You understand my dick has been in LA, Ohio and New York. Mm-hmm. And I got numbers to cor- to, uh, to relate to both those places. I just got to know. How does yeah. it stack up? 
We need <laughs> we need a uniform system here. What That's does why New York I'm... think of Jarrett's dick and bolts? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you're the first person I'm asking. So <laughs> as far as he knows. <laughs> yeah, right. There were like 20 <laughs> others before him, but <laughs> right. No, that's what uh, I used to. I used to work at Caroline's, and I get off work really, really late. Mm-hmm. Uh, some nights it'd be like three a.m., and I'd just go to the the train station and like forget to pee before I left work or, or the bar that I went to afterwards, and then you know just kind of lean up against the wall in the corner, like onto the and pee onto the tracks from, yeah, just like like I'm looking for my train, but I'm mm-hmm. real relaxed about it. And like, <laughs> if you see me from behind, it's like, what is that guy doing? He just. Just the looking, just third two. rail. Yeah, wow. How far do you think this tunnel goes? <laughs> Where so, is this train? Yeah, Where right. Um, so you know, this is uh, this is a topic that obviously we're not going to get into the the heavier stuff. At least, I mean, maybe. Who knows? Who knows where this conversation will go? It's already gone off the rails, the third rail. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, this is more you know, the the lightheartedness of like. This is an unfortunate thing that happens to some people who just happen to not be able to control when they have to pee or or uh, or when they want to get their dick sucked. Yeah, right, mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. Copulate in front of a cop. Unfortunately, it happens, yeah. um, and you have to tell people about it. Which is, it's a law that makes sense. You know, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. it's <laughs> if it can prevent anything bad from happening, I'm all for it. But there yeah. are going to be some innocent, uh, some some innocent collateral. That are going to uh, yeah. I to think at, at no point in the joke do I make it seem like Megan's law is a bad law, right? <laughs> that is the thing we should give do away with. <laughs> yeah, you're not like listen, this bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pissed off, and you guys are gonna hear about it. <laughs> no, you give it that spin where it's like I get to tell people, like I get to tell people. It's that that shift from like I have to go to work to mm-hmm. I get to go to work. You know, I have to tell people. I get yeah. to tell people. Um, and that's, you know, that's a, that's the tool that, that you could use as a comic. Just what that, that simple word from, I have to do this, to I get to do this. Um, it's one way to like cope with an unfortunate thing that happens to you too. Uh, maybe in a healthy way, maybe not depends on what you do with it, but I, I, you know, whenever something bad happens to me, I'm like, oh, I get to deal with this problem now. And oh, it helps. It like, it like shakes me out of being mad and, and feeling like out of control over it because, to me, humor is a, is a, a skill that allows me to, to take power over whatever problem I'm facing, and like that's an extremely healthy attitude to have. Uh, I mm-hmm. I'm, I'm being totally sincere. Uh, I listen to a, a podcast that gets a little, you know, meditation zen, living in the moment kind of life philosophy. And one of the things that I heard on there was. That it's that you can treat your life like, oh, this is the episode of the sitcom about my life where I go through this. Mm -hmm. This is the episode (laughs) of the TV show about me where I have to handle this, where I go through this, you know, and it can alleviate some of the the stress and pressure of the moment. The Uh, gang goes to the zoo. Yeah. The exactly. gang gets on the sex sex offender registry list. Yeah. It's a, and that's a great episode for any show. I mean, think about any sitcom you've ever watched. If there's an episode where it's like, this is the one where insert character here. Elaine, uh, I was just getting my dick sucked at the yeah. zoo. Like, yeah. what's the big deal? <laughs> Why do you got to get your dick sucked at the zoo? Yeah. Why can't you go home? <laughs> your mom's right there. It shrank considerably. <laughs> and the monkeys were laughing. Well, you should have been in the water. <laughs> <laughs> and Kramer bursts in. And he's like, Jerry, I got this idea for this pod that you could go in and, and you, no one can see inside of you. You can uh, get your dick sucked anywhere. Uh, <laughs> dick suck pods, Jerry. Stick pods. Dick suck pods. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm able to bring out my C-minus Seinfeld impressions Dude. on the show. <laughs> Too soon. Have you, either of you ever had that experience? Sex in public? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Never caught. Um, but I've definitely done it in places that were dangerous. Mm, define dangerous. Um, a stairwell of an apartment building. Okay. Uh, public bathrooms. Um, friends' apartments that did not know while there were parties happening. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the. I think that's the list. Yeah, full list. I do. I do know of a uh, of a story um, <laughs> at Caroline's. A comic got caught in the stairwell uh, by the coat check lady 
who I don't know if you're not familiar with the coat check lady, she's this little old Italian woman who is probably just like, she probably went to the bathroom and said prayers after seeing it. Um, I, I won't, I won't say the comic's name, but, but. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Louis CK. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's not having sex with anyone. Oh, and they're, they're just there while he's having sex with himself. Oh, that's uh, the guy yeah. that flashed me on the street. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, oh Yeah. <laughs> Does he have to introduce himself as a sex offender? Oh, no, he never got charged with a crime, so never mind. <laughs> I was going to say. Uh, it's so funny. My my mom's side is Italian, and so I'm just imagining my grandma mm-hmm. now, <laughs> like walking in on a comic, having sex. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing with your chungus day? <laughs> is that what they call it? That's more of like a Jersey Italian woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she did. Li- I mean, she's a, a New York. What's the matter, you? Hey, <laughs> gotta put your dick in places. Skay. And, um, do they call that gravy too? Because it seems to me that they're just calling everything gravy willy That's nilly disgusting. in Jersey. <laughs> I hate this. this <laughs> Speaking of grandmas, my grandma listens to this podcast, so I don't have any sexual stories. I've yeah. never had sex. So, mm-hmm. does your grandma listen to this podcast? <laughs> So for me, it was a movie theater uh, and oh, a playground. Yeah. A playground. Not no one was at the playground. It was at night. But um, yeah, movie theater, playground, lots of parking lots. Because um, I because for the first couple of years in college, I lived at my parents' house. I went to a local uh, school, and um, so yeah, so I had limited places to do it. Uh, in the middle of a golf course. That was cool. Mm. Ooh, yeah. while driving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> In a golf cart. It was the 18th hole. My, my ex lived on the 18th hole of the golf course. Oh, I thought you just had sex with 18 women. Yeah. <laughs> One at each hole. Uh, Come on, yeah. Nailing it. Our um, golf course is so big. I've never played golf like a full, you know, on like a real legitimate golf course. Our golf course is so big that you could hypothetically put a woman at every hole and have them be oblivious to the fact that there are other women there that you're <laughs> hooking up with. Depends. Depends on the layout. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say in theory it could be. <laughs> Depends on the amount of brush. If they're laying down. I would love to hear <laughs> some serious golfers talk about this as though they were talking about like golf tournaments. Just like, what yeah. do you think about Turnbull? Oh, Turnbull's great. You know? <laughs> uh, rolling Meadows is a little bit more dangerous. You know, yeah. It's a little bit more out in the open. Tori um, Tynes. <laughs> <laughs> you can have an orgy at every hole and no one would know. It's sex at the beach every single time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> avoid the, the Trump Doral golf course, though. Uh. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say avoid the sand trap. <laughs> yeah, that's that's every hole. is a, It's just a, it's a bunker. <laughs> Listen, I'm going in. Um, Ooh. So, yeah. So Brave the problem, Ohio comic goes in on Trump. <laughs> Breaking news. <laughs> Never been done. No one's ever had a Trump joke before. This is the Trump joke to end all Trump jokes. So, um, yeah, the problem with with the way that the system is set up is, is the, the umbrella is pretty big. For example, there was a couple that, that got caught on video doing it on the beach in front of, and there were like kids on the beach. Like, come on, really? In yeah. front of kids? That's outside that, of the umbrella. Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> That's just a no. But but from that perspective, so um, if you were to tell the joke from the perspective of that guy, because you kind of told it from your own perspective. Like um, as though there is a guy out there that could do this. As though you were the guy that, that was in the zoo that, that mm. is now a sex offender that has to go door to door to yeah. do it. Uh, how would that expand on the joke for you? Like, how would you, like, what would you explore from, from that person's point of view? Um, I mean, I suppose... In order to make it work as a stand-up joke, you would need to sort of establish your own morality mm. in that scenario because you ha- you'd have to make a joke about recognizing that it's wrong and then also potentially make a joke about how uncontrollably horny either you get or how impossibly uh, blind humans get when they get that horny, you know, something that people could relate to. But at the same time, I think the foundation has to be that you knew that you did something wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe a good comedic exaggeration about how careful you are to look for kids whenever you're having public sex, you know? As like, I think that it is unfair 
that I am being judged for this. Because you don't know how much energy I put into. I have kid dar. I have excellent kid dar for any time I do this. I have a system in place. You know, if you've ever seen like a TV show about <laughs> drug dealers, how they have like people posted up on the roof and everything, and they have like different si- signals from when the cops are coming. Like one person will be like, oi, 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 you know, and then the dealer knows to put their stash away. I have that for kids, for making sure that there's no kids around when I'm getting my dick sucked. I got stopped by a cop and he's like, what are you doing out here? I'm like, I'm looking for kids. Mm-hmm. Because I don't want to find any. Yeah. I want to make sure there aren't any. And she's right? sucking my dick so there aren't any kids in the future either. <laughs> yeah, I'm not making any that are going to look at me. Right. Right. This is for the good of the community. Yeah. Um, so so why, why do you think that it's important to establish that you know you did something wrong or you know you're, you're doing something wrong to the audience? I mean, I know that there are some comedians who can operate in that world of I'm a piece of shit. I do bad things. And I'm honestly not sure what the, what what the, the method is there for establishing yourself as that guy, almost the way that like Don Rickles kind of established himself as a not racist person who could make fun of black people and Asians and Jews and you know, whatever. Somehow he was able to establish himself as it's okay that I say this. It's all love. And, you know, nobody got mad at him. Maybe it would be different in 2020, 2021. I've got no idea. But Mm -hmm. I'm not that kind of comic. I like to have the ability to to establish myself as a a moral person. So that if I want to make a joke about something political, which I, you know, dip my toes into, as, as you guys know from the book that I wrote, I have that foundation. And people can't say, like, what do you, how can you, judge us for being anti-gay when you were just talking about, you know, uh, fucking a 12 year old or something, you know, how could you judge us? Just, you know, you just told a story about having sex with a prostitute without a condom, you know? And then when she called you about the baby, you said, get an abortion and change your name and hung up, Mm -hmm. you know, you're not allowed to, to tell us anything in that situation. (laughs) And I mean, I think that the, the, um, unconscious decisions that you make as a comic, when you are trying to establish what your voice is going to be and who you're going to be on stage. I don't know. It's complicated. And it has a lot to do with what works, what's getting laughs, but also how you want to present yourself. And I think that the how you want to present yourself thing comes in a little bit later towards your career when you're like, okay, this joke where I, you know, say something slightly offensive to women is working, but is that who I want to be? Is that the image that I want to be on stage? You Mm -hmm. know? And so, you know, I don't know, I don't necessarily know the answer to that. I just know that that's the comic that I want it to be, that I want it to, I don't want to be the guy that gets on stage and has, and kind of like rides the, uh, you know, razor thin line between this audience hates me and this audience loves me. Yeah, I think you made a good point too. Uh, you know, if you establish yourself as a piece of shit, the audience is a little bit more forgiving when you are a piece of shit. Because it's like, listen, I already told you I suck. Yeah, I'm well aware of it. I'm trying to be better, but it's not working. And like, here are my experiences with that. But see, the trying to be better thing is interesting. You know, like, are there comics who don't even need that? I'm sure there are. Oh, yeah. There are comics that they don't need that element of their set. The I'm trying to be better. I know I'm doing wrong. There are some comics who kind of relish in that place. I don't know. I don't know anybody who's working right now that kind of like fits that bill. I mean, there's guys like Anthony Jeselnik, but his stuff is so ironic. Mm-hmm. that you just you know that it's not true you he's a, he's allowed to go into those dark places because he's established how firmly he's not being serious how how clear it is that these are jokes mm-hmm. a level yeah. of absurdity yeah yeah, yeah mm-hmm. exactly the absurdity helps as well right it's almost like if you believe these are true like this is on you at this point <laughs> yeah 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 exactly <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> really um we had a comic on a few weeks back who uh, has a very narcissistic, cocky persona on stage, mm-hmm. and he never really loses it. But in a lot of his material, he gets his comeuppance, like in the punchline Ooh, of it. And so, so rather than you know, I'm a piece of shit, and I'm working on it. It's I'm a piece of shit, and I I uh, I suffer from it. You know, there is karmic retribution for it. Do not worry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whatever mm-hmm. you guys want to hate me, don't worry about it. Karma 
is fucking me over so hard mm-hmm. these <laughs> right. I can see how that works. Right. Yeah. And, and when we talk about persona on stage too, you know, it you're almost a character. And with any character, like you have, you know, you have a 10 minutes on stage or a half hour on stage, to almost establish an arc. Uh, if you are going to to kind of take that, that um, I'm a piece of shit perspective, either you're going to, you're not going to learn and you're going to keep uh, getting that karmic justice, or you are going to learn from it. And the audience is, is going to be on your side by the end of it. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know. Do you see like do you see a lot, a lot of that or or like how do you uh, feel? I honestly about that? don't know. Uh, like a lot of the comics that I work with, um, they are either in the same camp as me, where we we have an onstage persona, but the the morality of what we're telling is consistent with who we are. Mm-hmm. And then there's other comics that I work with that are just joke myths. They're like I they don't care about politics in on stage or in real life. Mm. I just, just want to be funny. I want to be clever. Uh, and I want it to be silly. There's no, there's no direction to what I'm doing. It's just fun. So I, I honestly don't know. It's been so long since, especially since the pandemic <laughs> happened. Right. You know, uh, even when I was working the clubs, there was so little that I would see of people doing their, you know, this is my piece of shit persona, or these are the more repugnant beliefs that I actually have persona. Yeah. I couldn't even, I couldn't even think about anybody who's like that. You know, I'm sort of, I think that when I first got started in comedy, I was a little bit more involved in every one of the groups that existed in New York where I'm like, okay, these people hang out together and they're like this, these people hang out like this. And I feel like since I've been uh, working, I've, I've found myself in the, a corner where there are comedians who are just, I don't want to make it sound like derogatory to other comics, but we're, we're kind of nice, you know, like we don't yeah. roast each other 24 seven. Yeah. We say nice things to each other. We acknowledge that other people have feelings and, you know, have emotional journeys that they go through. Yeah. And I like that. Like, that's the kind of person that I want to be. I'm glad that I'm not rolling with comics who feel like they have to barb each other every time. And again, not saying that that's a bad thing or anything, but because of that, now I don't see it as much. You can't laugh at that. You Can't Laugh at That is brought to you by Water Cooler Comedy. Now, for too long, we've been asking the question, should work be focused on work or fun? But Mark Twain once said that work and play are two words used to describe the same thing under different circumstances. So my point is that we're asking the wrong question. Instead of asking, should work be work or fun, The question should be, how can we make work fun? Whether it's a keynote speech, a half-day workshop, a 90-day consulting program, a customized corporate comedy experience for you and your team as you try to figure out how to reboard, how to get back to work after working virtually for a year. Why humor in the workplace? Well, studies have shown that humor builds resilience. It allows us to adapt to problems more quickly, more creatively, and more correct. It allows us to adapt to problems more quickly, more creatively, and more correct. I can't say collaboratively. It allows us to adapt to not being able to say collaboratively correctly. Because not only does laughter make us feel better, it makes us work better too. So why not make work the time and place to laugh? Check out watercoolercomedy.org. Can't laugh at that. You do something in in your bit that uh, that I think um, makes the joke palatable for everybody. Just the I had to tell you that, like I had mm-hmm. to tell you that I'm a sex offender and that I got my dick sucked at the zoo. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't know the the detail that you have to disclose with with the people in your neighborhood, but you know, if you're that guy that is mm-hmm. willing to get his dick sucked at the zoo, you probably are that kind of guy that's like. Dude, you'll never guess what I just did. It was like, I just met you, man. He was going to tell people anyways. Yeah. I, <laughs> one, of, one of my best friends, uh, the the very first conversation I had with him, and we were, uh, I was like 19. He was like 18. Uh, we never talked once before in in our life. We worked at the same place. Mm-hmm. And he walks in, I worked at a grocery store. He walks into the dairy cooler where I'm just like working. And, and uh, he goes, dude, uh, 
I was fucking fucking this girl on a washing machine last night. And I was like, all right, so this is how our relationship started. It's like, who, first of all, who double fucks? <laughs> like, <laughs> and, uh, and number two, like, yeah. I'm David, hi. Oh <laughs> my God. I, I'm getting a lot of joy off, <laughs> off of that story. Cause, Cause I don't know. Sometimes when there's something so redundant in that, I don't know what's <laughs> the funny. word. <laughs> I just, I just want to like, there was a guy that I knew in high school who everything that came out of his mouth was the exact same. It was like all about sex or drinking or Mm -hmm. jerking off or anything. And there was something so fascinating and joyful about him. I remember one day we were all at a coffee shop and um, it was the kind of coffee shop where, you know, I imagine it's a little bit more, happens a little bit more in small towns, but somehow we have this in LA. There was just a coffee shop that everyone in my high school would just go to. It wasn't near my high school. But it was just, if it was the weekend, you could just go to this place and you would probably see someone that you went to high school with, you know? So this guy was there and we're all hanging out, having coffee. And <laughs> this dude just stands up and goes, you know, I love to stick around, but I got a date with Jack. <laughs> and everyone was just sort of like, and he goes, <laughs> Daniels. <laughs> like, we, we thought it might be. It, yeah, might be yeah. <laughs> it might be off. It might be shit. Like, we don't know. But it's one of those things. And so that guy was like, I was fucking, fucking. (laughs) (laughs) Could have been Palance, Jack Palance. That really tickles me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, And and that, and we became friends, Uh, not because of that, but that's the Mm. story that I always tell about this dude, because he he was, he's the kind of guy that'd be like, oh man, I was getting railed last night on the the hood of my car. (laughs) Just like, all right, cool. Were you ambassador to Germany? All right. Well, this girl was stuck in my dick in my car the other day, right? Right. That's yep. the right. classic. That's the classic. I remember my first sex. Yeah. Like, that's all that is. Here, let me tell you about the only thing that I <laughs> that's interesting about me. Yeah, right. That yeah, actually exactly. bleeds into another one of my hobby horses is uh guys that feel like they have to brag about sex. Because mm. I remember when I I remember the transition from being a virgin to being a guy that had sex mm-hmm. and how much more often I brought it up right when, as the transition was happening because it was something that was like new and fresh to me, you know? And so like everybody I talked to, I was like, oh, I was talking to this girl yet. And, you know, we were making out of the bar, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then as I became a person whose sex became more regular in my life, it suddenly became weird and gauche and I don't know, like, uh, I don't want to say like braggy, but bragging kind of a pathetic way, you know? Right. And so now I have such a low tolerance for people who tell me sex stories like that, that don't seem to have any other point to it besides telling you that they had sex. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, there's a story that I, one of my favorite stories is about this girl that I had uh, hooked up with. And then my roommate had a night terror and attacked her. And it's a, it's a great story. <laughs> and I promise, I promise does not have any abuse, physical abuse in it okay. whatsoever. Okay. <laughs> Everybody was safe. She had a she had a nice time, I promise. But telling the story and getting to the part where I'm like, I had sex with this girl because I developed this dislike of guys that brag about hooking up, it's always the hardest part of the story. Mm-hmm. Where I'm like, you know, we were having a couple of drinks, went back to my place, and, uh, you know, because I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the guy that's like, and then we, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we gave it to her. <laughs> oh, dude, she was lipping out of my apartment. Oh, I injured this woman and I'm proud of it. Like, <laughs> go away. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. It's like, it's like if you get, if you get like, if you buy a Camaro, it's like at first, yeah, dude, tell your friends you got this Camaro and it's awesome. And like, you know, it gets this many horsepower and like, uh, you know, I take it out. But if three years later, you're still talking about your Camaro, it's like, come on, man. Like, is that all you got? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I kind of, I kind of feel that way. Um, I, I have a bit where, my so when my girlfriend and I first started dating because I had known her for a couple of years before that for a while before we started dating she thought I was gay and so like one of the first times we we hooked up like she we were just having a conversation after we finished and, and she was like uh she was like oh I always thought you were gay 
And, uh, and so I work that into a bit now and it, it still feels weird saying like, Oh, you know, I knew, I knew it was going to work out between us. Cause at the end of our first date, she was like, so you're not, and we finished hooking up. She's like, so you're not gay. And when, when I use that, like when we finished hooking up, it, it's a little uncomfortable because it almost feels like braggy about it, but that's mm -hmm. not the point of the joke. The point of the joke is that like, it's funny that she thought I was gay. And then, and then I continue to carry on and like bring up all the other instances where people have thought I was gay. Yeah. So I don't understand it. <laughs> but, I think hooking up and going at it are my yeah. two favorites going because at they're it. vague. Yeah. You know? And it doesn't seem like you're bragging if you're letting the person that you're talking to imagine that it could be anything. You know? Mm. So my favorite story like that was a guy who uh he was supposed to give the best man speech, but you can obviously tell he forgot what he was gonna say. And, and then, then he, like, like kind of pauses, and he's like, like oh, man, one time in college, and he's like, so there's this chick, and she's, like, kissing on my neck, neck right? <laughs> and then she wanted to talk to the groom. He's like, man, college was crazy. All right, peace later, yo, tight. And then, like, basically, like, did, like, a fake mic drop. He's like, I'm just kidding. And then sets the mic down, and that was his whole speech. Oh, uh, that. <laughs> that's dope. I love that. <laughs> like the whole reception, everyone's just like looking around, like, is he gonna say what's going on? Oh. <laughs> Could you imagine like some of the famous speakers in history just like working in the fact that they're getting laid into their speeches? Like Martin oh, Luther King was God. incredibly, he was sexually active. Like that's that dude. so fucking funny. <laughs> I More have a score dream. and yeah. seven years yeah. ago. <laughs> I was getting my ticks. <laughs> a house divided upon itself cannot stand. Like I was doing the Eiffel Tower with my bro. You know, we're spin roasting this girl. You gotta high five. You both gotta high five, otherwise you're gonna fall over. <laughs> That's what America is like. You gotta high five each other as we're fucking this. <laughs> All right, peace, peace later, yo, tight. tight. Peace <laughs> later, yo, tight. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Tear up that pussy. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, treat this wall like the pussy I hit last night yeah. and tear it up. <laughs> I regret that I have one life to give for my country, just like I had one nut to give to my lady last night. Am mm -hmm. I right, boys? <laughs> Oh, yeah. So those guys, Damn, those guys, oh, uh, man. But we all know that guy. Like, we've all, you know, we've all experienced uh, that dude's incessant story of the mm -hmm. same thing over and over again. It's like, dude, we get it. You have one thing. But, I mean, that like, that's kind of the guy that I picture in your joke. Like, that's that's who that guy is. 100%. 100%. Long story short, to, to bring this full circle. Um. God, that's funny. There's so many, there's so many different ways to, to look at it. Just as it's like a one minute bit, but like that, that's why I enjoy comedy so much is like, you, if you really like take a joke, you can really look at it from so many different points of view. Like, you know, as the neighbor that opens the door and has that happen to them, like there's that point of view. There's like, uh, you know, somebody in the audience, you also have to think of the perspective of somebody from the audience too, like who's hearing this joke. Maybe they know somebody, maybe they themselves uh, were a victim of, of, of an unfortunate circumstance with, with an actual sex offender experiencing this joke. Like how would that, you know, how those jokes that it's, it's harmless that you can still connect with that kind of person too. Well, yeah. You, anytime that you bring up a topic where, you know, we know that we're in the danger zone, there's so much work that has to happen in the setup to get the audience to not just immediately, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I've got a joke about abortion. I've got this joke, of course. I got a joke about pedophilia. That's more specifically about pedophilia than this joke. Mm -hmm. And the, the care of going into the joke, kind of unconsciously communicating to the audience, I promise you, I am not going to say the thing you don't want me to say about this. Mm -hmm. right. You know, I promise you that's not what this joke is. And it's it's subtle and it's hard, but it's necessary if you're a comic like me and not mm -hmm. like an Anthony Jeselnik type, you know? Mm -hmm. Helps no. keep them from getting distracted from paying better attention to, to your jokes. They need all their focus. And if they're losing focus on that, yeah, I feel like that's, you know, 
mm-hmm. at least part of the reasoning. Yeah. Right. And the joke clearly isn't about Megan's law. It's about the, the, like what you have to do and like this specific harmless circumstance of, uh, of somebody having consensual relations with a woman in a public place. And now mm-hmm. here's this character who has to tell people about it. Um, there's another, uh, I, I just kind of found this as I was kind of looking for other uh, comics who have jokes about it. Um, it's a comic by the name of, now see, I don't even remember his, his name. Uh, shoot. It's a really good bit. I swear it's a classic. Oh, you uh, picked it David out, Britton. So. David Britton. Yeah, I did. It's just one liner. I never heard of the guy before. Um, but it, I mean, it's a funny joke. Um, and it, and it takes it plays on the terminology of uh, of having to register to be a sex offender. So, Jeremy, if you want to pull up the uh, the clip by David Britton. A couple of weeks ago, I had a registered sex offender come to my house and knock on my door to tell me he lives next to me now. Because I guess that's like a real law, that if you're a registered sex offender and you move, you're legally obligated to let your new neighbors know that you live next to them now. And I'm sure that would have been upsetting for any of you to have heard, but it was especially upsetting for me because I misunderstood what registered sex offender meant. So, so I was just like, you can just sign up to do that to people? It's a play on the words. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Registered sex offender, like, oh, you can sign up for that. I mean, so there are any number of ways to take this topic that's, that can be heavy and, uh, and, and pick at it in a way that's funny for a wider audience. I and- do like his tone where almost he's excited to register also. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. even if you're allowed to, you still shouldn't. You know? Right. <laughs> so he comes from a, a more of a naive perspective mm-hmm. of it. So it, yeah. it's almost like, aw, you know. <laughs> it's kind of a glee to it where he's like, oh man, I gotta, I gotta find this register. So I don't know what yeah. he's planning on doing, but for some reason that gray area works. Right. Yeah. You know, where it's like, you shouldn't be excited about this, but we get it. You know, it's fine. Yeah. That's yeah. He, he doesn't have to like, he doesn't have to disclose any more detail. You can just go with this punchline as an audience and wherever mm-hmm. it takes you, that's on you. Yeah. Um, and then there are of course other bits that are, that hit the, the nail pretty, pretty squarely on the head. Uh, this is a sketch from Mr. Show. The old HBO sketch show Bob Odenkirk and David Cross. Now, normally we don't we don't do sketches here. We stick mostly to stand up. But this was uh, this is one of my favorite sketches because it's it's very irreverent. Uh, it's definitely a sign of like the times. So this was this was produced in the late nineties. And uh, yeah, let's just uh, in, enjoy this uh, this classic sketch by Bob and Dave, and Mr. Chef. What else? It now costs $800,000 a year to jail just one criminal. That's enough money to send a family of five to college. Yay! Or to send that same lucky family on a 79-day rafting expedition. But at Pembleton State Prison, a new money-saving program allows criminals to be productive members of society while serving out their terms. This is the home of Larry Kleist, rapist. But you wouldn't know it if it wasn't for the friendly reminders Larry is required by law to provide. The day he moved in, he took an ad out in the local newspaper. Now, this rapist lives just like any normal, non-raping person would. Rapist coming! He goes to work accompanied by an assigned state licensed public warning engineer. Rapist here! Rapist, backing out! Larry can even drive himself to work. Rapist Rapist coming. coming. Don't Don't get get raped. raped. Rapist Rapist coming. coming. Cold calls, my favorite part of the day. (laughs) Hello, I'm Larry Cleese. I'm a rapist. Have you considered insurance? Hello, I'm Larry Cleese. I'm a rapist. Are you interested... Hello, I'm calling about insurance. Don't, please don't hang up, please. Uh, uh, my name is Larry, I'm a rapist. Uh, I, I don't, 
people don't seem to be interested in insurance these days. I, I think the industry is in, in a slump. <laughs> Did you freshen me up? No. But Larry carries on. Hello, insurance is my game, Larry is my name. Raping was another game of mine. Have you considered... Hello? And the program's such a success, it's been expanded to include other criminals, allowing convicts to live, to the commission. work, Mayor, Tom Boudinier, Cabington News and Views, pedophile, sodomized my nephew. Just what is going on over there at that zoning board? <laughs> and love. <laughs> right. So obviously that's not a sketch that would really fly today, but I, I think... I think it still gets a lot of points across. I don't know. What are your first impressions, guys? Good idea. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm like, I, I mean, being, uh, trying to be a as progressive of a person as I can, one of the things that I do think about sincerely is prison reform because we have a really high uh, recidivism rate here in America. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there are... Places in the world where the criminal justice system is not as um, punitive as ours, and it's more about the the logistical side of things. We want to p- put these people away. They have to be punished, so they're not incentivized to do it again. But at the same time, life in jail doesn't seem like that, uh, you know, what do you call it? Doesn't seem that productive. And so it is kind of... I. I, I, I feel like I can see David Cross's politics in this sketch where he's like, it just seems like a much better way to use that money and also make sure that this person is punished for the awful thing that they did. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> the, the thing that I think makes this sketch teeter more on uh, acceptable uh, than, than like crossing the line is that they, they make it clear that that character is the bad guy the whole time. Uh, I mean, just the, you know, sales is my game. Raping was my game once, to, you know, and and he's just sleazy. The people in the break room walk out of the room when he walks in. Um, you know, the woman that he waves to doesn't wave back. I mean, just like little things like that. They make it clear that this guy is garbage. Uh, you know, what he did was bad <laughs> and and he's paying the price for it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I can see people being like, well, the punishment isn't good enough. But it's like, yeah, well, it is a joke at that point. With, yeah, with, no, the, this with, is with the joke, sketch. Yeah. So, right. You mean, it, you mean it was a joke when he was being followed with a van playing the ice cream truck? It's like Big jingle. Chanel. Yeah. yeah. Big Chanel. Yeah. It's, a, it's a little bit like that uh, Black Mirror episode where you can just get blocked. Like you can be blocked from the world and everybody just sees like a gray husk. Mm-hmm. They can't hear you. They can't interact with you. Mm-hmm. And that is a type of punishment. I, I'm not here to mitigate what the correct punishment is. But it is a punishment. Yeah, that's not as as Greg Stone uh, put it in in a previous episode. Uh, comedians are great at poking coals and things. Don't ask us to come up with a solution. Don't come, <laughs> ask us to go. <laughs> yeah, up that's what we're here for. That's yeah, our job. yeah. yeah. Um, I have a couple of solutions, but they're uh, uh, meant to be bad. Yeah, they're purposefully bad ideas. Yeah, you know? right, right, right. Right. And, and that's what this is. I mean, you know, you can see why and I'm with you, too, on, on the whole prison reform thing. Like, mm-hmm. you know, there it, it works better in other countries. But why is that? Why aren't we adjusting to that? That's a whole other that's a whole other can of worms. Soapbox that I could get on. Yeah. You know? Another. Yeah. We'll, we'll explore that rabbit hole another time. <laughs> well, David, it's ethnic cleansing, but we'll keep going <laughs> right now. That's not good. Let me talk um, to you guys about eugenics. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> just get all the bad genes that exist. Kill all those people. Okay. So there was this guy named Eugene, right? And he yeah. had a really bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the sketch does a couple of things to make it funny. It starts uh, silly. Well, well, first of all, it talks about it talks about the cost of incarcerating somebody for a year, and then and then they use that to say, well, you could use that money to put a family of five into 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 college, and then they show like a grandma and like parents and the kids. So that's it's kind of silly. And then all of a sudden, and then you could use that money to send them on a seventy nine week white water rafting trip, which. <laughs> Introducing silliness to a bit early can soften the blow when you do hit with the heavy stuff. 
So that way, when the when the guy, you know, when they showed the house with the signs, it says rapist lives here. Like, it's not, it's not like people who are watching it are like, oh, this is a joke because they've established that this is a silly world that we're operating in. I feel like that's that's my take on how why that joke is okay. Any input uh, from either of you as to to why that? No, works? I think you I think you hit the nail on the head once again, man. Yeah. The whole reason for this podcast grand slams on this show twenty four seven. The whole reason for this podcast is for people to tell me that I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> we were going to call this uh, <laughs> "Tell David He's Right," uh, but we decided to to narrow it down. To, you should get like a police like system that like pats you on the back whenever that happens. <laughs> yeah. Like I did it again, everybody. Mm. Rounds himself with Yesman. Yes, yeah. This is a pandemic. Ah, uh, Aaron Yesman. He's my lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jewish. I'm allowed to say that. Yeah. <laughs> You're entitled to ver- f- verbal compensation. <laughs> You're doing a great job. You crossed the line. Now, there are some other unfortunate circumstances where people have been charged, uh, have been labeled as sex offenders because of something they thought was innocuous. For example, uh, there was a couple who took pictures of their kids, like taking baths when they were little, Mm -hmm. and they developed the photos at Walmart and the employees at Walmart called the cops on them. (laughs) Okay. This is a lot less dark than I thought it was going to be. Right. Yeah. No, they did. These these are people who didn't do it like really Mm -hmm. what they didn't think what they were doing was wrong. You know, if you're if you're committing like a sexual assault, you're not in the moment being like, this is. People are going to be fine with this. Like you're going to try to hide it. Um, and whereas in this case, like you wouldn't get if you were actually doing child porn, you probably wouldn't get those pictures developed at Walmart. Probably not, unless you're you know casting a wide net for fellow fellow pedophiles. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know <laughs> what do you think about these? Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Did oh, you yeah, develop no, those? No, no. I hate them too. I hate them too. Yeah, That's yeah. just my kids. Yeah, I was just making sure no one here like these. <laughs> you passed the test. Good. <laughs> now give me my pictures. Mm-hmm. That's so um, funny. My mom has a picture of me from when I was like eight, just out of the shower. Uh, and the scale of the picture is it goes to the top of my head, and you can just see the crack in my little bottom. And I'm just sort of like, I'm, it's from behind, so I'm just sort of like turning around like this at my mom, and I got this like little little gold gold Italian horn necklace, you know? <laughs> and we yeah. discovered this recently with my fiance, my fiance who's obsessed with the picture. And it's like, this is the, <laughs> this is the most embarrassing thing in the world and I love it. And I was just like, what? How did this happen, mom? What was going on? Why did you take this picture of me? And she doesn't remember the story. Because I can tell you that I wouldn't have been like, oh, you want to take a picture of me naked just out of the shower? Sure, okay, so let me get like one of this. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> get my good side, mother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and my fiance was like, "Can I keep this?" And I'm like, "Can you keep child pornography?" No, no, you cannot. No, we're yeah, just <laughs> we're destroying this. That's weird. Yeah, no, there's definitely pictures of me in compromising positions when I was like three, mm-hmm. just like running through the house without any clothes <laughs> on. My mom's like, "Oh, to take pictures. This is adorable." Were you guys then, naked? Naked kids? Kids that they didn't want to put their clothes on? <laughs> uh, at one point, I'm sure. Yeah. Now I'm how, never nude. It's weird how parents will just take pictures of their kids in the bathtub. That's like, yeah. yeah. Back then, I don't know about now. Well, is, that that a thing, is that a yeah. thing now? Like parents don't I, do that anymore because of that? I've seen it on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, all right, why'd you post this? I mean, parents take kids of their na- p- parents take pictures of their naked kids. Yeah. It's just like a thing that happens. Yeah. And I don't know what the instinct is there. I hear that when you have a kid, you change. And now that's a thing that you want to do. Mm. It's really cute and you love it and you want to take mm. a picture of it and you want to memorialize this moment when you're when you're washing your kids in the tub. <laughs> <laughs> it feels weird to me though. It still feels weird. I don't understand the instinct. Yeah, that weirds me out too. It feels like keeping a girlfriend's nudes after you break up. Like why, I don't need these anymore other than for nefarious things. So why do I want to keep them? <laughs> yeah, that's weird. But again, I'm not a parent, so I don't know. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I am an ex, but I I'm not sure a parent. Hope, I sure hope that family who put their pictures through Walmart did not have to go on a sex offender register list for that. Well, fun fact, they did. Come on. They guys. went on the central, uh, central registry of sex offenders. The mother who worked at a school was suspended from her job for a year <laughs> while the investigation was underway. And the couple spent 75 grand on legal bills. 
Uh, they, they sued the city of Peoria, the state attorney general's office for defamation, and they sued Walmart for failing to tell them that they had an unsuitable print policy and could turn over photos to law enforcement without their knowledge. Jesus. Um, I mean, from the perspective of, of the person working at Walmart seeing pictures of naked kids, you got to we're so quick to, to like try to root out the problem right away rather than like, Oh, maybe these are just parents who are taking pictures of their kids. Yeah. I don't but know. But again, <laughs> if know. you're actually dealing with a nefarious person. Yeah. I never want to come down on the side of we're being too loose. We're not being loosey goosey enough with pictures of naked kids. You know, these are nothing but pictures of dead bodies. I'm sure, it's it's fine. Just, I'm sure it's just his grandparents or, yeah. you know. It's Halloween. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. So, it seems very unreasonable. But I I hesitate to be like, why, why don't we just tell Walmart employees, if you find pictures of naked kids, just give them back to that person. I don't know. I don't know what the solution is to that. It just feels like reading the story that that was unfair. What happened to those people? Mm -hmm. I, I feel like, yeah, to, to get them put on the, on the sex offenders uh, registry, I feel like maybe bring CPS and the police over to that house and conduct an investigation uh, with the pictures and like the kids and stuff. That's like a good starting point without having to press charges. Honestly, it feels like the sort of thing you should have been able to clear up that day. Right. You know, right. Oh, they're your kids. Okay. Well, let's go prove that. Yeah. Proved. All right. Yeah, we're going to talk around, to the kids. Yeah. See if there's any more pictures of, of naked kids who aren't yours. And if they're not, we're in the hood. Yeah, sorry for the inconvenience, but <laughs> you understand, right? You would want, if, if somebody else had these pictures, you would want us to do it their own investigation. So it's that cool. whole... We're on the same yeah. page. Yeah. Everybody's in agreement here. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> yeah, no harm, no foul. But then oh. for a year and $80,000, ugh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a nightmare. Poor guys. Let's say one of those parents just happened to be a comedian. <laughs> mm -hmm. What are some ways that they could find the funny in that circumstance? That that terrifying. Well, now that it's in the in the rear view, because mm -hmm. um, of course, tragedy plus time. You know, you gotta. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be a absolute monster, but at the same time, like as a comic, that's something that if it were to happen to you. If you didn't turn it into a bit, you're not doing your job. Oh my god! Yeah, that's that's a tough one. the The joke of proving that your kids are your kids, mm -hmm. and how that shouldn't take a year, you know. And then you can kind of fictionalize the scenario where you know you bring your kids to the court, and you're like, okay, tell them that you're our kids. And the kids being shitty about it, just being like, where are the kids? Yeah. You know, <laughs> they realize they got their parents by the balls so they can really fuck around with it, you know? And it's just like, are we going to get McDonald's on the way back? No? Well, then maybe I don't know who my mom is. Yeah. <laughs> well, my memory's kind of fuzzy. <laughs> you told me to get out of the ball pit the last time, and I did not care for that. So Yeah, uh, you don't know where the pictures are. I hid them. <laughs> like I, I, I can report them at any time. Maybe the kids are taking more naked pictures of themselves. You know? <laughs> Camera, dropping them off at Walmart. <laughs> Mom and Dad told me to do this. To, do you guys uh, know Rob Ryan? Do you know his material at all? Not familiar. Okay. He's, a, he's an awesome New York comic. He's on my podcast, Is This Anything?, and he had a very dark childhood with an abusive mom. And he has a long bit about this, about how he was given the power of whether or not his mom was allowed to come home or not. <laughs> and I don't even want to try to tell the joke. It's so good and it's so masterful how he navigates this really dark territory to find something funny about how, how children shouldn't be that powerful, you know? And I feel yeah. like this is uh, in the same neighborhood of that. Like, children, we need you to grow up for a second and prove that we're not pedophiles. Yeah. Prove that we're not child sex offenders. <laughs> Please do that. And we'll get you a dog. I swear to God, we'll get a dog. Yeah. The police interviewed about three dozen friends, family members, and coworkers to make sure that they weren't... <laughs> They underwent but also, psychological evaluation. Those are the people that you would hide it from. Yeah. Unless like, oh, they're yeah, also... They're like, 
<laughs> they tell us all the time. Unless they're also sex offenders, in which case they would have your back and they would not <laughs> throw you under the bus. <laughs> oh man. I now I'm now I'm thinking of like a sketch where the friend is like, wait, those aren't their kids. <laughs> and is now somehow convinced that like everything that the cops are saying is the like the worst possible scenario is true. It's like Oh my God, the other day they picked up not only their kids, but one of their friends from school. You crossed the line. Yeah, um, you can get put on the sex offender registry uh, for if you're a minor and you are having consensual sex with a fellow minor. That's really? And, and you get caught. Yeah. Uh, 29 states require registration for consensual sex between minors. Wait, so if you're 16 having sex with a 16 year old partner, yeah, <laughs> uh, you can get you can be part of the sex, child sex sex offender registry just for that. That's and then you've got it. And then you're like 25. You're going around. And you're like, yeah, I had sex with a 16 year old <laughs> when I you was know? 16. Yeah, yeah. But was- I'm not allowed to contractually. I'm not allowed to say I was 16 though. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's I'm a sex that. offender. I had sex with a 16 year old <laughs> when I was 16. Come on, it's yeah, illegal sure. to tell people how old you were at the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, a teenager can wind up a sex offender for simply taking naked selfies. It is a dangerous game. Mm-hmm. When you take selfies, you your cloud could get infiltrated. And then those pictures get, you know, spread around. So I do want to discourage kids from taking nudes. Yeah. And and honestly, as a, as a teenage boy, like I know, and it would probably include that guy who's like, <laughs> you know how much head I'm getting? probably send those pictures to a bunch of his friends. Like, check this, mm-hmm. check out what I'm hitting right now, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but also, if you're an adult and you get one of those photos circulated to you, you are you are now the sex offender. So I feel like that's fair. <laughs> when I was growing up, my neighbor got busted for uh, being a sex offender. Or he uh, was the ringleader of a child porn ring. And the feds came and took him away. He did 10 years and everything. He had two, like, toddler children. That's it's really terrible. weird. He wasn't producing it, but I mean, nonetheless, he's terrible. But it like he um, he was a distributor, and he was a he was a uh, grade school, like elementary school, like a uh, camera installer, like That's- surveillance guy, like that does it. Like the the school I, like contracts people to do it, not him. Like actually setting up. Not that that makes it any different, but I'm just saying. It's, crazy what is like. I just thought of a terrible joke where he's like on contract and he's like, so you just want these in the bathroom? <laughs> just the bathroom. Like, no? Yeah. <laughs> oh, we got these okay. new toilet cams if you want them. They go yeah. in the toilet. You can see I mean, <laughs> Why else did you think I asked if you wanted waterproof? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it's That's a nightmare. Well, this, yeah. this, I think um, you wrote a book about Kellyanne Conway. Have you been mm-hmm. paying attention to what's going on with her daughter? And the, the like, child abuse that's going on over there? Yeah. I mean, uh, very peripherally. Um, and I, you know, when I whenever I hear a story like this where I, I am not charged with being the arbiter of whether or not something is child abuse or not, I try to keep a distance of it because I'm like, I'm not a professional. I don't know everything about this relationship. Mm-hmm. So I am not going to... Um, make any claims about it. I will say that it does seem awful that I don't think that a mom should be treating her daughter in that way. I also didn't watch all the footage, so I can't, I'm not an authority. Yeah. Um, apparently but, she, uh, she oh posted God. a nude of her daughter. Uh, I didn't hear about that. That's awful. Yeah. Oh yeah. See, the thing is, so I heard about that and I heard mom. about the potential <laughs> and I heard about the potential abuse and it just like completely changed my view of this awful, awful person where I was like, yeah, she's awful, but she's just trying to get a paycheck. She knows right from wrong. And then this happened and I'm like, no, she's like rotten to the Mm -hmm. core, you know, Mm -hmm. like an opportunist is one kind of awful, but then this is just like, no, you're just like a bad person. People that are excited about working for Trump are like bad people. She never struck me as that kind of person. She always struck me as the kind of person that's like, I just want that paycheck and I want that prestige. But now I'm just like, oh my God, yeah. Just terrible from toe to tip. Right. Yeah, I wish I'd have been meaner. You can't laugh at that. There's any number of angles to kind of approach this. Um, You know, it is unfortunate when somebody does something that doesn't warrant it, but obviously the law is there for a reason. It's a good reason. And, uh, you know, it's growth in our society. Now, I just wanted to bring you on. I wanted to talk about, I mean, it's a great bit. 
Thanks, man. It's a one minute joke. Have you ex- have you expanded on it? Have you added more to it? Uh, I haven't. The only thing that I do do is, depending on how hot the crowd is, I'll sometimes improvise more of the dude. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes I will, uh, you know, talk about how God, I'm, I'm, uh, I got a lot of high fives to give today. I got a high five every dude on this block. I'm gonna have a sore arm by the end yeah, of it. Yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, there was like, yeah, my hand was. hurts, and not from all the spanking. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I've never done. I've never done a like. You know, who was the girl? I've never expanded it that way. That could be a fun territory to go in. Um, and what's her experience like? Does she have to do this also? Did she get away or something? I don't know. Uh, I do like, and I kind of I came up with it on this. I, with you guys, the line I was going to tell you anyways, you know, but now I have to. That could yeah. be a fun thing to throw in there. Hmm. Um, but I've been telling that joke for so long that I'm forgetting all the different variations that it has gone through. Has it bombed? Oh yeah, I mean, I think that any any comic who who says they have a joke that has a hundred percent success rate is lying to you. <laughs> yeah, even my yeah. best jokes, I would never give it more than like a ninety percent success rate. Yeah. You know? Um. But yeah, no, that's a consistent one. I've actually been using that as a closer on the road um, for a while now. What happens if it doesn't, like if you're using it as a closer and it doesn't work, do you do you have like a, a, a saver line or do you... No, like, my transition? saver line is, good night, everybody, and then I leave. It's <laughs> all right, you're going to forget about me in, in if, 20 minutes anyway. If my set went so poorly that by the time I get to my closer, I'm imagining two different scenarios where I'm eating it all night and then I do my closer and it doesn't do well, or... I'm doing okay all night, and then my closer eats it. Like, something went wrong, you yeah. know? And if I'm eating it all night, and then my closer does poorly, I'm like, well, I was expecting this. Okay, I just <laughs> got to get out of here as quickly as possible, get my check, and run away. Uh, but if not, then, you know, what in the world? I can I can imagine if I'm doing okay, and then that joke does poorly. God, wow. It's like, what, did you guys all come from the zoo today? <laughs> the only time that I can imagine a joke like that doing poorly in that situation is if there's some sort of interrupter, you know, like somebody drops a play, a, a, a tray of glasses in, in the middle of an important moment or something. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I don't have a save. I just like, all right, well, that's it for me guys. Yeah. Buy my book. Take care. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get to the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, I'm just going to use the zoo as like my punchline for everything now. Go to the zoo? If you could give an inexperienced comedian uh, any word of advice when it comes to developing a joke around this topic about uh, the, the sex offender registry being a sex offender, um, anything like that, what would you tell them? Uh, just you can get an easy laugh by saying something shocking um, and to challenge yourself to try to find something better. Try to find something unique go from not a to b not a to c but a to m a to n you know find the angle that isn't obvious find the angle that is not going to be funny just because it's offensive Mm. we've all been there like i'm so edgy i'm this is got to blow people's minds and Mm -hmm. change their lives i saw this dude fucking eating it at an open mic which is not a a hard thing to do like we all eat it at open mics they're terrible (laughs) right (laughs) Yeah. This guy was eating it, doing like offensive stuff and not clever, offensive, just offensive by itself. And he used the saver line at the open mic. He was like, ah, oh, you guys didn't get the memo. I'm the asshole comic of the night, you know? And I'm like, we're all comics, man. Like, we, yeah. we know what you're doing. It just sucks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> know your audience, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They literally know us because we're going up before you yeah. and after you. You'll see us around town. Man, we're all doing the same open mics. Yeah, yeah. Is he going to do that every open mic? Is that you? You yeah. see him like two hours later at another mic. And he's like, "I'm the asshole comic." We know you're. You we think you're at, just an asshole. You told us at the strip. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you want to plug? Any uh, projects you're working on? I saw you just started a new podcast. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I am doing a Zoom show uh, on March 22nd. With the hilarious Kristen Key at nowhere, nowheretime.com. You can get tickets for that. I do a show every year on my birthday where I write 
multimedia bits with slideshows and songs and videos and stuff. And Chris and Key does hilarious songs. And so we're sharing the hour together. It's going to be hilarious. Check out my podcast, This Is Anything, where me and three other professional comics, Brett Druck, Rob Ryan, and Anthony Kapfer, work on new jokes together. And, uh, you know, we've got a Patreon and uh, check out my website, jaredberenstein.com. That's where you can find all the links to all my various projects and my social media and whatnot. Check that out and uh, let them tickle your funny bone, but don't report them to the police uh, (laughs) because they they don't want to have to go door to door to let people know that they tickled your funny bone. All right. uh, (laughs) Steve, anything else you want to throw in? Uh, No, no, I'm I'm good. Any sponsors that you want to shout out? (laughs) <laughs> this is walmart walmart uh, be careful what pictures you develop here yeah all right uh with that being said remember that uh, no matter how unjust it may feel uh, no matter if it's a, a legal order that you have to go door to door and tell people remember that you can always laugh at that special thanks to gold knock studio you can find Golden Ox Studio for all your podcasting needs at goldenoxstudio.com. Uh, hit up Jeremy. He is fantastic to work with, professional. Uh, he makes podcasting easy. And uh, if, you're, if you've are if been kicking the tires on starting your own podcast, definitely give Golden Ox Studio a look. If you'd like to weigh in on today's topic, follow us on Twitter at You Can't Laugh Pod. Or like us on Facebook if you can't laugh at that and tell us how you did laugh at today's topic or how you didn't. This is all about the conversation, is what I'm saying. All right. Bye.